The Nightingale by Hans Christian Andersen Long ago, in faraway Cathay, which is called China today, there was a powerful emperor who lived in the most beautiful palace in the world. It was made of very costly and fragile porcelain, and everyone, including the emperor, had to move around and live in it with great care. A small army of servants cleaned it constantly with soft sponges and feather dusters. The garden of this palace was equally remarkable. It contained the most extraordinary flowers, and the most interesting ones had little silver bells on their stems that tinkled in the slightest breeze. Every detail in this garden had been carefully planned and executed. Even the chief gardener himself did not know for sure where the garden ended. But if you went on walking through the garden, eventually you came to beautiful woods with lofty trees and dark blue lakes. Finally, these woods reached the sea, where tall ships sailed in, right up to the trees, bringing travelers and trade to the emperor's land. In these woods, there lived a nightingale. A nightingale is a small, gray, rather plain-looking bird. But there is nothing plain about the voice of a nightingale. And this one sang so deliciously that even poor fishermen, burdened with work and care, would pause to listen to its song when they were drawing in their nets at the end of the day. The travelers who came to the emperor's capital from many foreign lands admired the palace and the gardens very much. But when they heard the nightingale, they all exclaimed, This is the most remarkable thing of all. Some of them returned to their own country and wrote books inspired by the nightingale in the emperor's woods. One particular book of poems became very popular, and eventually someone sent a copy as a gift to the emperor. He sat in one of his golden chairs, reading and nodding his head, very pleased to hear such beautiful descriptions of his city, the palace, and his garden. But the nightingale is the best of all, he read. What is this? the emperor wanted to know. The nightingale. Why have I not known this? Is there such a bird in my own empire, and I have never heard it? I have to discover this fact in a foreign book. The emperor was most vexed at this state of affairs. He summoned his gentleman in waiting, who was so grand and conceited that he rarely spoke to anyone of a lower rank. The emperor got right to the point. There is said to be a miraculous bird called a nightingale right here in the woods outside my garden. Why have I never been told anything about it? The gentleman in waiting was alarmed by the tone of the emperor's voice and the piercing look in his eye. As you can imagine, he became very diplomatic. I have never heard it mentioned, Your Majesty. It has never been presented at court. Well, said the emperor, in a manner that caused a chill to run down the spine of the courtier. I wish, indeed I expect it to appear here this evening to sing for me. The whole world knows about it, yet I am in the dark. I will endeavor to find it, Majesty, 
assured the gentleman in waiting, bowing several times as he backed out of the Emperor's presence. But where was it to be found? He ran upstairs, downstairs, in and out of the numerous rooms of the palace, and down the long corridors, asking everyone he encountered, Where is this singing bird called Nightingale? But no one knew anything about it. Finally, he returned to the emperor. What could he say? He took a deep breath and told him that the bird must be a myth, invented by the poet and repeated by other writers. Your majesty should not believe everything that is written. The courtier trembled as he said this. But this book was sent to me by the emperor of Japan. It can't be untrue. I will hear this nightingale. I insist on its being brought here tonight. I will extend my most gracious protection to it. But if it is not forthcoming, I shall have the whole court trampled upon after supper. Sing Pei! cried the gentleman in waiting, and off he ran in search of the elusive bird. This time half the court accompanied him as they did not wish to be trampled on after dinner. After they had questioned a number of people outside the precincts of the palace, they found that the singing bird was well known to the outside world, but not to those living inside the very private and insular court. These courtiers just did not get out very much. Finally, a kitchen maid, of all people, told them what they needed to know. The nightingale? I know it very well, and indeed it can sing. Every night I take leftover pastries from the kitchen to my sweet old mother, who lives by the shore, and on my way back I rest a while in the woods. When I hear the nightingale, it brings tears to my eyes. I feel as if my mother were kissing me. Then the little maid led the crowd out into the woods. Look, there it sits, she said, pointing to a small gray bird up among the branches. The gentleman in waiting could hardly believe his eyes. How common the creature looked! Where were all its colors? Surely this could not be the fabled bird. Then the kitchen maid called out, Little Nightingale, our gracious emperor, wishes you to sing to him tonight. With the greatest pleasure, replied the nightingale, warbling in a delightful fashion that sounded like crystal bells to the courtiers. My songs sound best among the trees, the nightingale remarked, but he went willingly to the palace because it was the emperor's wish. How remarkable, they all exclaimed. Later that evening, the entire court assembled to hear the nightingale sing for the emperor. Even the little kitchen maid was there, having been given the title of Special Imperial Cook for her service. A curved golden rod had been placed in a stand next to the Emperor's throne to serve as a perch for the nightingale. Everyone waited eagerly for the concert to begin. The Imperial Hall was hushed and quiet when the nightingale came in on the arm of the gentleman in waiting. He hopped gracefully to the golden perch, settled his feathers, took a deep breath, and began to sing. Tears came to the emperor's eyes and rolled down his cheeks. The nightingale continued singing ever more beautiful melodies, and all hearts present melted. As you might expect, the emperor wanted to reward the nightingale. But the bird 
politely declined. I have seen tears in the eyes of the emperor, and that is my reward. The tears of an emperor have a wonderful power. I need no other reward. The emperor invited, actually he insisted, that the nightingale come and live in the palace. A large, solid gold cage was made for it, but the door was never locked. The bird had the liberty to walk out twice a day, and once during the night. However, twelve footmen always escorted it to keep it safe, each holding a silk ribbon fastened to the bird's leg. This was not very pleasant, but the nightingale put up with it for the sake of his emperor. Every evening he sang for the emperor in the garden until the cares of the royal day melted away. Courtiers and townspeople would gather along the edges of the garden to hear the marvelous songs, and they too would have their hearts and cares lifted. Then, one fine day, a large parcel arrived for the emperor. On it was written in oriental characters one word, Nightingale. It was from the emperor of Japan, a neighboring country to Cathay. The emperor thought it might be a picture book about his celebrated bird, but it was not a book. It was a splendid and complicated mechanism in a box, an artificial nightingale, an automaton, which is a kind of robot, exactly like the live nightingale, except it was studded all over with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. When it was wound up, it sang one of the nightingale's songs and wagged its golden tail in time to the music. There was a note that said, the Emperor of Japan's Nightingale is very poor compared to the Emperor of Cathay's Nightingale. Why do you suppose the Emperor of Japan would say this? Well, in the Orient, you never brag about a gift. Rather, it is customary to pretend it is small and ordinary, especially if it is grand and costly. The Emperor decided that the two nightingales should sing duets for him. But this did not work out very well musically. The real nightingale sang in its own style, but the artificial one could only sing the one song, although it sang this one song very well. The imperial music master, who had probably been jealous of the real nightingale for some time, declared that the automaton was perfect and correct in every musical way. The ladies and gentlemen in waiting thought it was much prettier to look at as it glittered with precious stones in the light. Furthermore, it could sing the same lovely tune three and thirty times over and never get tired or make a mistake. After a while, the emperor wanted to hear the real nightingale sing again. But where was it? No one had noticed that sometime during the repetitious concert it had flown out an open window and back to its own green woods. Ultimately, the music master persuaded the emperor that the artificial nightingale was superior to the real bird. Not only on the outside, what with the diamonds and rubies and all, but on the inside as well. You see, my lord and ladies and gentlemen, with the real nightingale you never know what you will hear, but with the artificial one everything is decided precisely beforehand. So it is, and so it must remain. You can account for things. You can open it and show the human ingenuity in arranging how the song goes and how one note follows on another. 
Only the kitchen maid, now a special imperial cook, expressed a different opinion. It sounds very nice and is surely more dazzling to look at than the real one. But there is something missing. I don't know what it is. The next morning, the real nightingale was officially banished from the kingdom, and the artificial bird took up residence on a silken pillow close to the emperor's bed. It was even given a royal title, Chief Imperial Singer of the Bedchamber. Its rank was number one on the left side, because that is the side where the heart is located. And even an emperor's heart is on the left side of his body, like you and me. The music master wrote numerous volumes, like an encyclopedia about the artificial bird. This was a long and boring treatise, written in the most difficult Chinese characters. But everyone pretended to have read and understood it, for fear that they might be thought unsophisticated or stupid. The whole empire paid homage to the emperor's artificial nightingale, and time passed in this fashion for a year or so. Then one evening, the jeweled bird was warbling away as the emperor lay in bed awaiting sleep, when something inside the bird gave way. Whizz and whirr went the wheels. Then a very small clank. And the music stopped. The artificial nightingale was frozen in mid-song. The emperor jumped out of bed and sent for his private physicians. But what could they do? Then he sent for the imperial watchmaker, who examined the bird, while the physicians and the emperor watched anxiously. After much tinkering, he got the bird going again. But he said it was simply worn out from so much use. The mechanism was so delicate and complicated that it could never be truly repaired. The bird should only be permitted to sing once a year after that to preserve what was left of its abilities. Five years passed. And one day the emperor fell gravely ill. He lay pale and cold in his golden bed. Everyone assumed he was dying, and he was left pretty much alone, except for his doctors, as the courtiers went off to curry favor with the son they expected to be the next emperor. Even his children hardly visited him. The emperor had so many children that they barely knew him, and he barely knew them. The artificial bird sat cold and quiet on its pillow in the gloomy bedchamber. After a few days, the emperor could hardly breathe. He seemed to have a great weight on his chest. He imagined that he saw death sitting atop him, holding the emperor's golden scepter and wearing his crown, and pressing him down. He thought about his good and bad deeds. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Invisible voices whispered to him. Perspiration poured down his face. He had never felt so utterly alone. Music! Music! he cried out. Sound the great drums. Play the flute, that I may not hear any more of this. But the voices went on whispering loudly to him. Music! Please! Sing, little golden bird. Sing, I command you. The emperor broke down and sobbed. But the jeweled automaton was silent. There was no one there to wind it. And so... It could not go. Suddenly, the critical voices stopped, and Death turned his head toward the window. From the outside, 
came a burst of song. The nightingale, the real one, had flown all night and all day when it heard of the emperor's need, and there it was, perched on a branch, singing its heart out. First comfort, and then hope, began to return to the emperor. The voices were silenced once and for all, and Death himself was charmed by the music. Go on, little nightingale, sing on, Death urged in a hoarse voice. Yes, if you will give me the emperor's scepter. Yes, if you will give me his crown, said the nightingale cleverly. And Death relinquished each of these treasures for a song. The nightingale sang about a quiet churchyard where dark roses bloom, where the purple elder flowers perfume the air, and where the fresh emerald grass is watered by the tears of the mourners. This made Death long for his own garden so much that he vanished out the window like a cold gray mist. Thank you, precious bird, said the emperor weakly, but with brighter eyes now. I treated you unfairly, and even banished you, yet you have come back to me. You charmed the evil voices away from my bed, and even lured death away from my heart. How can I ever repay you? I do not sing for reward, said the nightingale. My heart is glad that my songs have helped you. This is a priceless jewel for a singer. Sleep now, and I will sing more to you. When you awaken, it will be a new day. The emperor fell into a deep and refreshing sleep, and the nightingale sang all the rest of the night. I do not sing for reward, said the nightingale. My heart is glad that my songs have helped you. This is a priceless jewel for a singer. Sleep now, and I will sing more to you. When you awaken, it will be a new day. The emperor fell into a deep and refreshing sleep, and the nightingale sang all the rest of the night. When the sun shone in the window, and the emperor awoke, the nightingale was dozing, for he was tired from so much flying and singing. You must always stay with me, said the emperor gently. You will sing only when you wish, and I will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces. Please don't do that, said the nightingale. It did what it could, and what it could not do was not its fault. Keep it as you have always done, for it's indeed beautiful to look at. It is a work of art, and perhaps the Emperor of Japan can have the mechanism rebuilt for you. As to living in the palace, I cannot do that again. I need to nest in the trees by the sea. However, I will come often in the evenings and sing to cheer you, and to make you thoughtful, too. I will sing of both the good and the bad in your kingdom, much of which is kept hidden from you. I will sing of the happy and of those who suffer. I will also fly far and wide to sing to the poor and the peasants who are far from you and your court but who love music as much as you do. But you must promise me one thing, the nightingale added. Anything, anything, the emperor cried. Tell no one that you have a little bird who tells you things. It will be better so. With that, the nightingale flew away. Later, the emperor's attendants came in to see to their supposed dead emperor. He forgave them for the intrusion with a nod. Finally, he said, 
good morning, but nothing more. He just smiled, and so it was.